the project. You're going to be, I think, great, uh, emotionally moved when you see how beautiful uh, it, it already looks. Some of us have already seen it, spending some time, uh, and uh, God has been very gracious to us. It really uh, makes the church much, much brighter, and, and I think even the acoustics will be a lot uh, nicer as well. So I, I thank you for your support of that project. Because of the uh, marble project in the church, we had to move here to the hall, as you know. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And I've been here uh, three times during the week just to meet with the contractors, some of the workers, meet with Costa, Marios, uh, and others about details, whether it's electrical boxes and plumbing, exactly where the marble should go, etc., etc. And during that period of time, I'm able to come into the church, into the hall, obviously, spend some time here as well. And something struck me last week, and I've been thinking about it ever since. Because I don't believe, I don't know if you feel the same way, I don't believe that anything, and I mean this sincerely, anything happens in our life that is not under the providence of God. He is in total control of our lives, whether we realize it or not. The problem oftentimes is He puts things in front of us and we miss it. We just miss it. We miss opportunities, we miss uh, occasions when He is actually talking to us and oftentimes prodding us in one way or another. Well, that happened to me last week. I came in very early to begin the Ortho service, last week's liturgy. And I walked into the, into the hall here, still dark outside, I went to the altar, where you're using now the, um, the tabernacle there, the kubuklion, in order to do the liturgy. And I saw uh, the painting, really it's a photograph, of what is behind the kubuklion, which is on the wall there. And I, I, I invite you to go and see it later if you don't already know what's back there. Any of you remember what it is? The Parthenon. The Parthenon is there. And I'm looking through the altar, through the Kuvuklion, and I see there uh, marble, columns of marble, some of it squaring, squares, some of it is, is cast down, and people walking around in it. And I was struck by the coincidence which again I say the providence of God is never a coincidence, that while we were doing marble in the hall, in the church, right behind on the altar table, God puts a picture there, a photograph of me, to see marble, the building of the Parthenon. It's not by chance. Not by chance. And all week long I've been asking God to tell me why it's there. What, what am I, how, what's the connection here? So of course I spend time reflecting and doing some study on my own about the Acropolis, which by the way you know the Acropolis is, is all, many cities have Acropolis. Acropolis is not nothing but the Acritis Polos, the top of the city. So every city has an Acropolis, so to speak. As a matter of fact, Boston, the highest point in Boston, what is on the highest part of Boston, do you know? Beacon Hill, no. You can actually see uh, Fenway Park from up there. I mean, I pause on purpose because now you will always know this because I'm making you suffer a little bit. As a good teacher, that's my job, is to be attacked under your seat. I, I'll give you a hint, I spent seven years there. The seminary, Holy Cross Seminary, the Orthodox Theological School of the Orthodox Church in America, is on the highest, is on the Acropoli of Boston. And when you're up there, and the chapel is on the highest point of the Acropolis of Boston, you can look down and you can see the whole city. And for us, back then, sinners that we are, trying to become priests, we would, uh, we would um, wonder why we were going to chapel as opposed to being down at Fenway Park so we could go watch the Red Sox play baseball. 
So I spent seven years on the Acropolis in Boston. One year I actually spent in the University of Athens. I went to the University of Athens and uh, I was taught uh, the classes. We had to take undergraduate classes my freshman year and we had to pass uh, the standards of America. So I was taught American history in Greek by, by a Greek professor. So everything had to be done in Greek, but it had to uh, coincide with the, the courses that we would have had here in America. So while I was there, I spent much of my time, and I'm sure you've guessed, on the Acropolis. I would go up uh, Kolonaki, have coffee there in the beautiful plate, platea there, wonderful. Then I would go up to Kolonaki, uh, up uh, to, uh, to the Parthenon there. And back then I used to sketch, I used to like to sketch. And I would do that on purpose in order to meet girls. <laughs> I was single, you know, 19 years old, up at the Parthenon, and I would do that. So I spent a lot of time up there, uh, up in the Parthenon. And here is the Parthenon again. Here is the Parthenon, the, the marble that we are building over here in the church. And of course you know that I, I also helped construct the, uh, the church of St. Mark in, in, in Boca. So I did some research about the Parthenon. Do you know, first of all, there are two temples up there? The Parthenon? Why is it called Parthenon, by the way? Those of you who are proud to be Greek from Greece? Very good. Athena, the patron saint of Athens, was the goddess of Parthenia, of virginity. So their Parthenon, it was in honor of her. How did she become the goddess? Why did she become? This is where it gets interesting. So there were two people who wanted to become the patron saint of Athens. Athena, Athena, and one other person. Poseidon, bravo. Poseidon. Poseidon was almost the patron saint of Athens. So Zeus, this is according to the mythological story of how uh, Athena was chosen, Zeus says we're going to have a contest. And the contest is going to be between Poseidon and Athena, and the Athenian people will choose. So up there, if you've ever been up there, and you go to that area there, there are two temples there still. One dedicated to Athena, and the other one dedicated to Poseidon. If you go to Poseidon, you will find a hole in the temple where, according to the myth, is that Poseidon said, I'm going to give to Athens water. So he takes his, his what's it called? The trident. And he smashes it into the ground, and supposedly a well is created all the way down to the ocean, and water came up. And then Athena, what did she do? What did she offer? The olive tree, the olive tree. And as you know, Greece says we have plenty of water. <laughs> we need olive trees. And so they chose Athena. And that's how the Athena became the patron saint. So there was a contest between the two. And to remind the Athenians of that struggle and other struggles, those two are there. The Acropolis of Athens and the Parthenon has been at the center of struggles for its entire life. You know, the Acropolis of Athens actually had a um, something there, according to uh, uh, people who do those kinds of historical archaeological digs, 3,000 years before Christ, something was up there, they found. So there have been many people who have wanted to be at the top there, and there's been many struggles. Do you know the Parthenon once was a mosque? It was a Catholic church. It was an Orthodox church during the Byzantine period. But it was also a temple to who? The gods, pagan gods, many pagan gods. But as a parenthesis, I found something else out that I found very, very, seem uh, to go very significant. And that is in, let's see if I get the, the dates right, in 1820, one, I think it is, 18, the 1800s. The Ottoman Turks 
had, con had control of Athens. The Greeks wanted to throw the Ottoman Turks out, obviously, during the war. And the Turks retreated, the Ottoman Turks retreated to the Parthenon. And so they're fighting the Greeks from a high position, which is a good place to be. But one thing happened to them. They were up there, the Greeks were on the bottom. So because the Greeks are on the bottom, they can continue re-engaging their armaments. They didn't have to run out of ammunition. The Turks, however, after a long, prolonged battle, ran out, were running out of ammunition. And the Greeks heard what the Turks were going to do. They were going to tear down pillars of the uh, Acropolis, of the Parthenon, because in the middle of the Parthenon, the pillars, there's a metal there, there's iron there. And so they figured if we tear down the pillars, we can use the iron and turn that into armaments, make bullets out of it. When the Greeks found out that's what they were going to do, you know what they did? Anybody know? They gave them ammunition. The Greeks gave the Turks ammunition because they would rather lose their lives in battle than have someone destroy the temple of the Parthenon. When I read that story, I said, oh my God. Our Acropolis, our Parthenon, if you will, is the altar table of Christ, is the church is the sanctuary, is our faith. Are we willing to do the same? Because we're waging a battle too. There's a contest that's going on right now too. Not between Athena and Poseidon, but between Jesus Christ and all the pagan idols of this world, whether we realize it or not. And they are in battle for control of our faith, of our life, of our God. Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves? Are we willing to sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to protect the church from the onslaught of the enemy? Are we? Really? That's the question that I've been battling with all week long and I share with you, and I think that's why it's there. To show where we come from, as an, as an ethnic group, those of us who happen to be Greek. But I would venture to say that every nationality has its Parthenon. Every nationality, ethnic group has its Acropolis. But ultimately, at the top of that, cannot be our ethnicity, it must be Jesus Christ. There is no ethnicity in Christ. Remember last week it said, in, in Christ there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, on and on and on. Are we ecumenical the way we should be? That's why I, I celebrate when I hear the, the Lord's Prayer in so many languages. Today, how many languages was it? Very impressive. Very impressive. And what I'd like is I open up a parenthesis, Manoli, if you can get them, the ones who uh, recited in different languages, to give me the, the ending, just like I do in the English, in their language, and I can try to learn to do that. That would be interesting. As long as I'm not judged by my accent when I do it. So that's what I was thinking about. And then I could not help because I have to tie it into scripture. There is another uh, uh, monument there as well, if you've been up there. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, metal uh, emblem there. And do, do you know what it is when I'm talking about? It is the speech that someone gave up there. No? St. Paul, when he went to Mars Hill, it is the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, of St. Luke, where he talks about what St. Paul did. St. Paul went there. And I actually went, and I spent some more time on it this, uh, this week, and I was struck by the first line of that, and by the way, it's in Greek, up there. Of course, it should be in Greek. He was preaching to these individuals. He was speaking to those individuals. And why was he up there talking to them? He was an evangelist. Paul, he was a, a Jew, a, a, a short Jewish man who became a, a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And we, we owe St. Paul so much. And so as he was traveling around, he ends up in Athens, of course. The intelligentsia of the 
civilization in those days. And he was walking through the city. And I'm sure he was taken by the beauty. And you can only imagine Athens back then, how it looked. All the uh, beautiful buildings, the, 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 the museums, the art, etc., etc. And it says here in the, seven, in the 17th chapter begins the 16th verse. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed. So the Greek word there, he was perplexed. He was in anguish over something. To see a city, it says, full of idols. And the Greek word there for full of idols is a word that means, think of a jungle, where if you lose a golf ball in, in this jungle, it is so lush, you can never find it. It's just all these vines. So as you're walking, you can't help but, as a matter of fact, it, uh, historians say that back then, it was easier to bump into a god, meaning an idol in Athens, than it was to bump into another Athenian. That's how many idols were everywhere, if you can imagine, in the city. Everywhere you would go, there would be an idol. Different kinds of idols, different kinds of different things. And Paul is walking through the city, and it says that he was perplexed. He was very much uh, upset to see this. So he went to the Jews, and he went to the, the, Greek, the God-fearing Greeks, and he began to talk to them about Jesus. And they invited him to go up to the intelligentsia up at the Parthenon, and there he preached the gospel to them. And he says, I see that you are a very religious people. And you have one God that's called the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. And thanks to him, ultimately we are here today by being up at the park. And why that park is there. So I share that with you and I end with this story again that connects to the story of the, the courageous Greeks in 1821. In 19, early 1900s, the Parthenon had fallen to someone else. And a certain flag was flying over Greece, over Athens. Who, do you know whose flag it was? The Nazis. It was the flag of the swastika, flying on the Parthenon over Athens. And that was a sign of Hitler saying that, I am going to take all of Europe. You know who took it down? Two young college kids, they said no. And they snuck up and they took the flag down. And the next morning, the Greeks and everybody else woke up and there was no flag. Now, I'm not sure if there was a Greek flag hanging up there. I can't imagine those Greek boys not putting a Greek flag up there. But, uh, but they took down the swastika. And it was such an important sign that they did that that all of Europe sees that, saw that, and said, you know what? If they have this courage, we're going to have courage too. And it started the war against the, the Germans. That's what we can be proud of as Greeks. But not only that, it's a symbol, it's a sign, it's a message to us that are we willing to do the same thing for the church? Are we willing to tear down the signs, tear down the flags of anything, whether it's narcissism today, whether it's nihilism, whatever it is, pluralism, and say, no, there is only one God, his name is Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead, and those of us who have life in him have life after we pass on as well. This is why we're beautifying the church. This is why we have a church, and for no other reason. May the Lord give us the strength to rebuild our lives as we rebuild our parish, so that we can dedicate ourselves, uh, as St. Paul did, and those young men to the flag of the cross. Amen. Amen. He's right.